So to pull us all together on a lot of these um, aspects, I'm going to focus more on a large scale aspect of fungi. And most of it's not going to be my work directly here. Some of it might, some of it won't. But it's going to look at what recently we've been able to capture some data, other researchers around the world, looking at some of the broader aspects of how fungi contribute to soil health and why, so why all the things we've talked about in terms of how fungi grow, what they do, their enzymic capabilities, the development of fungi, this whole issue of fertilization or no fertilization, when to fertilize, mineralize. What do we know about those aspects relative to how ecological systems really function? And then what are some of the large scale things that we do? We've talked about tillage and fertilization, primary as being the dominant ones for agriculture. But we're going to look at this whole question of how do, because part of what has to happen for you folks is you want a stable production system. And what does it mean in an agricultural system in the Southern High Plains to be stable? What does it mean to allow you to be able to predict or to be able to you know, deal with climate variability and droughts and extremes and things like that? How, can you, how do you manage for that? Because obviously, you know, for, for last year, you couldn't manage for it. I mean, you simply couldn't do anything. And then I talked, I talked at the at the symposium about, well, what happens with soils as they're going into and coming out of drought? And I may show a little bit of that today, too, for those that weren't there. But I have another figure to start out with, and it goes back to this whole notion about <clears throat> an ecological setting, irrespective of whether it's agriculture or not. What does fertilization actually do to an ecological system, right? And so, but again, it all ties back into this notion of healthy soil, in terms of food production, water, and carbon storage. Those are the three things you're trying to maximize. And the question is, okay, you need the fungi to be able to do that. The question then becomes, what fungi are you actually increasing or decreasing? And so that's where we're going to look at this next figure. So <clears throat> this is a paper that was published at the end of 2021 uh, in Nature. So uh, and this received a lot of... Um, discussion, but the overarching factor was nitrogen and phosphorus fertilization consistently favored pathogenic organisms over mutualistic. Now, these were in grasslands, so what they did is they looked at grasslands, you know, from 25 grasslands around the world, and they did what's called a meta-analysis. And what the black lines are where there are positive impacts the red lines are where there are negative impacts. And so what you can see from this study is that nitrogen and phosphorus, then N and P, basically what they did is they ramped up the pathogens and interacted with the saprophytic fungi in those despite anything else. The mycorrhizal fungi were always decreased. So, and again, this is not agricultural systems. These are, these are, these are grasslands, but, but you're farming in grassland soil. And so the dynamics and the climate is such that irrespective of where the grassland is, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact it. Now, one of the things that came out is that the, um, the abundances of saprophytic fungi were not altered. But one of the things they did say is that while the abundances were not altered, the composition of that abundance changed. And it goes back to the, what we talked about earlier about whether they're basidiomycetes and ascomycetes and zygomycetes. And do you have the right mix of fungi? It's like, your, it's like your cover crop. You can always grow a cover crop, but what type of cover crop matters? The amount and the biomass may be the same, but the effect of that cover crop on the soil is going to be, is going to be completely different. So this aspect really has influenced then and we've known, as I said, because of what mycorrhizae are and how they interact with the plant, that phosphorus and nitrogen were going to change that outcome. But we also see that in, ec in ecological systems in general. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that this study also showed, this is another study relative to um, growth of fungi and respiration rates. Remember I was talking about the other day about respiration and fungi and burning off carbon. And 
one of the things, they were looking at two different groups of fungi, but one of the things that is important is that the upper group where they're respiring off more CO2, right, was always in the high nitrogen systems compared to the lower nitrogen systems. And it mattered what fungi you were talking about as to whether or not, that's what these indications are, whether it was trichoderma or whether it was mucor. These are systems that were highly fertilized compared to these. And so the indication is, well, if, you're in, if you have carbon there and you give them more nitrogen, they're going to respire more. And while they will do that to build biomass, as I've indicated all over the day, you don't want them to burn off all of your carbon because they won't do what's necessary to start to build soil organic matter. So, impacts of fertilization. This is the final component. As the CN ratio is lowered, fungal use of organic matter increases, as does the respiratory. Fertilization decreases carbon stocks if there is no attention replacing lost carbon over time. You have to be able to do that. And for us, for you, it's a question of how to manage that. Now, I showed this the other day, and this is, probably, this is the newest study. This came out in 2022. Um, what, this, what this study did is it took, it took about 135 different individual studies and did what's called a meta-analysis on it to look at the relationships between soil fungal diversity and the stability of ecosystems, these are grasslands, to disturbance of some type. And what they discovered is that as the, as the diversity of fungi in your system and their systems increased, you got greater stability from, with the soil mic saprophytic fungi. As you had more saprophytic fungi, the stability of the system increased. If you had plant pathogens increased, they decreased. But notice there's no effect of mycorrhizal fungi. These different lines simply indicate different types of grasslands. And so I'm not going to talk about that as much, but the point is right here. As the diversity of fungi in your systems increases, the stability of the system to productivity from year to year to year, despite differences in environment, was increasing. So under, so in this, so what was happening is that what stability measures is the ability to produce the same productivity from year to year, irrespective of climatic conditions. That's what stability is measuring. And what they discovered is in grasslands, as you increase the level of saprophytic fungi and the diversity of saprophytic fungi in your system, the stability of the system increased. So the more you can encourage a large group of basidiomycetes and ascomycetes and mycorrhizal fungi, the better off you're going to be in terms of the ability of that ecological system to be stable. Now, we've talked a lot, I can figure out where this is here, there we go. We've talked a lot about the mycorrhizal component. What they discovered, and I think it's on this next slide. No, there's another component, let me go back. The mycorrhizal fungi did not show any, any linear relationship, negative or positive. But I'll talk about what, what else they, they, they discovered on that. Now, I think Dr. LaSalle mentioned something about resiliency and resistance, or maybe it was uh, Dr. Zimmer. You know, <clears throat> what the things, not only do systems have to be stable, you want to you ask, you want to ask, are they able to be resilient in that, and they, if, if, if disturbances in climate do occur, when do they fall apart? How long will it take for them to fall apart? And that's resiliency. And so what they found is they were more resilient when you had greater numbers of saprophytic fungi, when your root endophytes were present. As your pathogen levels increased, your systems were not very resilient. And again, there's no indication of mycorrhizae except in these grasslands you tend to see this, this increase. So basically the outcome of this is that not only do they keep them stable, but they deal with perturbations better. And these are, not, these are environmental perturbations not caused by you. These are, these are perturbations caused by natural changes um, in a growing season. So here's where the outcomes. 
a consistent stabilizing role the diversity of soil fungal decomposers. A greater diversity of soil decomposers provides a constant source of nutrients for plant growth, connecting the above ground to the de through the decomposition process. This is the benefit of having that stable network. And there was a positive relationship between the proportion of mycorrhizal plants and ecosystem stability. But diversity does not seem to be the linkage. The linkage is simply that you have mycorrhizal plants in the system. And higher diversity of fungal decomposers and root endophytes is positively and consistently associated with the resilience of productivity after drought. That once you got out of drought, the productivity of the system was able to quickly respond positively after that drought event. And that's really what you want. You want to, be, you want to have systems that, of course, we're going to get droughts. And of course, some years, the productivity is going to be low. But when the system is good, you want the system to be able to respond as best it can. And that's what this shows. By having that fungal component, the system is able to take advantage of the rainfall when it comes. Now, in terms of how fungi increase drought recovery, right? So, so again, I mentioned this resistance of ecosystem productivity, uh, the diversity of mycorrhizal fungi, and even, even this question of root endophytes. So this is simply repeating what we talked about. But it goes back to having that diversity of fungal um, components. OK. So comments. The maintenance of diverse fungal communities is essential for addressing droughts and maintaining system productivity. The increase in soil carbon is leaked to the diversity of fungi interacting with the plants and plant carbon from the roots. And maintenance of the soil food web is critical for developing, maintaining soil health. Everything I've talked about all day really comes down to these three things. If you want some overarching principles, it's this. The question is, from, from your perspective, how you manage that determines this. Determines the stability of your productivity, determines how you respond to drought, and determines whether or not your system is able to function when conditions become adequate for it to function properly. And now again, and if so, this is also part of the part of the part of the problem of, of fertilization. You know, it's dry. You add a certain amount. Well, that's not always going to, as you see, that's not always going to be beneficial to what's going on below ground. And that's it. No, no. So this, this third one here, <clears throat> there was a question asked during the conference, and somebody asked, you know, they're, they're coming out with this nematode-resistant cotton. Right. And, you know, people are having nematode problems, and it likes it because, you know, monocultures of cotton, not a healthy soil, food well, all this stuff. Well, um, I know that you were asked this question. I don't entirely remember your answer, but, I mean, like in USDA, they have the oversimplified picture of the soil food web. And one of the most important critters, critters on it was the nematode. Right. And so if you are growing monoculture cotton, and you have been, and you've got poor soil health anyway, and then people have nematode problems or the root knot, whatever they're, they got, uh, reniform, mm -hmm. and they do this nematode resistant cotton, which I've seen the numbers on it, you know, through Cotton Incorporated, this and that, and I mean, it whacks them dead or not. Sure. Does it wipe out pretty much all the nematodes and just knock them out of the soil food web? No, it's, I mean, so here's the thing, too. It turns out that there are three basic type, four basic types of nematodes in, in, your, in your systems. There are nematodes that are bacterial grazers that only eat bacteria. That's all they do. They go around and they, they, they gobble up bacteria and they scavenge that. And their moth parts are such. And the, and the, now, again, keep in mind, too, nematodes need a water film to move around. They are a certain size. Depending upon the pore structure in your soil, they can only get certain places. But where they can get, they will, they will scrape off the bacteria from things. They don't need plant roots. 
So if a plant is, is keeping the root knot nematodes out, it's keeping out, their, it's keeping out the plant nematodes, but not necessarily these nematodes. Now that's one group. So you have, you have the bacterial feeding nematodes, and they're small. And then you have the fungal feeding nematodes, and they won't eat the bacteria. And you know the reason is, they're bigger, and they need more carbon to, to exist. So, there's, so again, if I gave you pizzas the size of a dime, you wouldn't come to lunch. Right? Because, you, because you'd, you'd have to eat gobbles of them to get one slice. You'd end, you'd end up spending all your time eating those little tiny things. Well, the same thing's true in, in soils. The, the smaller nematodes specific, specifically go after the bacteria. Now, the larger ones, the fungal feeding ones, go after the fungi. And what they do is they either eat them like spaghetti or they stick a long straw into them and suck out the contents. Now, then you, have a, then you have a larger nematode that eats the smaller nematodes like Cheetos, and they simply gobble them down. But here's the thing, that you, but here's the thing. When a bacterial feeding nematode is eating bacteria, the nematodes are 15 to 20 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. The bacteria are three to one. What happens to all that nitrogen that that nematode has consumed. It poops it out as ammonia. And so that's the food web. The reason grazing is important in these systems is it's quickly converting the microbial biomass to a plant usable form. And it's mineralizing that organic component to its inorganic state. That's why these food webs are so crucial. I mean, I think someone mentioned this the other day, but I'll tell you too. A grazer in any ecosystem, whether it's cattle or, any, or anything else, is important to the system because what it's doing is it's taking the biomass that the plants have, all the carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus in, they're eating it, and then they're excreting it as urea and fecal material, which is then quickly available to the nutrients, to the plants, and to the microbes as nutrients. And that grazing is what's running the speed of the cycle. Will the cycle work by itself? And the answer is yes. It'll just be much slower. It's not fast enough to give the productivity. In your systems, the reason mineralization is so important is that you probably have enough nitrogen there in its organic form, but the plants can't use it. They need it in the inorganic form. And so what is going to speed up that release is the grazing on the beneficial fungi and all the fungi that are there. So you need all of that in. You need the microbes to be able to start the decomposition, the fungi to decompose, but you need the other stuff to be able to mineralize. That's why everybody keeps looking for earthworms. They're easy to spot. What do earthworms do? They speed up mineralization by eating everything and pooping it out. And then all that stuff becomes mineralized. I mean, think about this. Before we ever developed, before we ever had Hubber Bosch and made our own nitrogen fertilizer, that's what night soil was. And we took all the urine and fecal material we generated in our homes and spread it on the fields. That's how we got nitrogen back. Because what, we, what, what do we do? We mineralize that stuff. All the food we eat is mineralized, right? And we give it back out. But in soils, naturally, it's the grazing of that microfauna, that, con that contribution of the food web, that releases that back to the plant quicker. Now, that's one component. Subsequently, they die too and they get decomposed. So all this process is a series of rates at various scales of time. And that's why the systems become productive. Well, the problem is that in agriculture is you want it to only run over a year's time. Well, it can't do that. And so the, I think the question you were talking about, you know, year to year in terms of how, to, how much mineralization, it's a, it's a sequence of events over subsequent years to reach the, to reach the rate at which, it's, which is necessary to produce the crop you want. And that's why, and that's why all, this is, all this is important. But as the study showed, 
you know, what we're finding is you're going to have the fungi. If you don't have the right fungi, the system will not work. It'll just, what it'll do is it'll simply be too slow. And then you have to fertilize all the time. And if you want to cut costs, you know, that's not going to happen. Right there? <laughs> One more? No, you keep, keep skipping it for some reason. Uh, Two forward. One more. That one right there. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. Pardon me. So if I'm plastic soybeans or something that has a, a narrow C to N ratio, that same fungal, basically the fungi are going to eat my soil. No, so here's the thing about, here's the thing about legumes too. And I, I should have mentioned this earlier. When you plant a pea, uh, uh, what, a black eyed pea, a soybean, anything in your field, that has the capacity to, to fix atmospheric nitrogen. That nitrogen is not available to those microbes that year. The plant has to decompose. You're building it for the next year. Right? That nitrogen does not get released immediately. Why? Because the plant's tied it all up in its own biomass. It may release some as exudates, but it's not releasing all of it. And keep in mind, the rhizobial bacteria and the other bacteria that are nodulating with that, with, that, with that legume are fixing nitrogen for the plant to give them carbon. They're not releasing that nitrogen to anything else either. It's only going to their host. Now, the host is going to slough roots and stuff like that, and you'll get some, but that's not any different than a grass. But when that legume dies, all the nitrogen that it had fixed is now in the system where it wasn't before because it's taken it out of the atmosphere. And so that's the benefit of having legumes in the system. Legumes don't benefit the current crop. They benefit the next year's crop because it takes that time to process that, that material. So you're all, again, ec ecological systems, I guess I like this analogy, ecological systems are always building toward the future. They're never, because that's what successional patterns are. Ecological systems are always moving forward in time to, to reach some other state. They're never, they're never they, they don't ever stabilize at a given level. They're always moving and trying to, and trying to up what they do. So why, but we tend to sell out the future generation. Yes, we do. <laughs> no, no, and that's exactly right. We don't, we don't, I mean, in, in, in agronomic systems, because of what has to happen, we don't look past the first year. But what this whole thing is saying is you, if you only look at the first year, you'll never get anywhere. You're really building toward the five and ten year level. See you. With the residue, the carbon that is in the plant, does that help buffer this, the carbon to nitrogen ratio as that's all kind of breaking down and releasing? It, yes, well, it is because it's adding, so what it's doing is it's, it's adding nitrogen biologically that you don't have to add chemically. Okay. That's what it's doing. So you don't have to add that amount chemically. So it's by far a lot more beneficial. It, well, it's cheaper, but it's, all, it's also not a, not a slug of nitrogen coming in all at once, right? It's going to do, it's going it's to gradually release that over time. And again, all ecological systems do that. So would it be beneficial to have, like, when you do a cover, have a lagoon in there? Always. Yeah, because, because if, because, so, you know, because again, you know, there are calculations as to if you have certain number of legumes per per acre, how much nitrogen don't you have to add? And that's not for the current year, that's for the next year. Because that nitrogen then is in your system that you didn't add. You didn't add. 
And so that's, that's the benefit from that. So you probably, you're probably familiar with Richard Mulvaney. Do you, my takeaway from, from that, I mean, do you agree with the fact that I thought they were saying when you fertilize something, you're actually not fertilizing the plant, you're kind of fertilizing the biology that then release things? Well, it goes back to this first picture. Well, where was it? It must have been in a, in a previous one. Um, no, it goes back. I mean, part of, it, part of it is you are fertilizing the biology because everything needs nitrogen. It's a question of where that balance is between applying too much. And again, you're fertilizing because the system doesn't generate its own enough. That's the problem. If, you, if the system generated its own nitrogen and balanced that, you wouldn't have to fertilize. And that's, so, and that, I mean, that's where, the, the, that's where the dilemma comes in. Where is that, where is that balance for what you want to get out? And again, I, you know, and it, I, I guess in some ways, I've, from my perspective, what I've heard over the last couple, three days is this. A lot of it depends upon the economy of scale as to what you want to achieve. If, you're, if you have enough nitrogen coming in biologically, you can cut your cost. You may get lower yields, but you don't have to pay all the money for nitrogen fertilizer, right? You're not going to grow. So, you know, is it a difference between one and a half to two bells an acre? Maybe. But if you decrease your fertilizer cost by 60%, are you ahead? You know, or running the tractor. I mean, that's really what it comes out. The problem is we don't, I mean, some of you do look at it. And I, you know, I'm just amazed. I, well, as Debbie knows, as we try to figure out about this farm in, in southwest Wisconsin, I got to get somebody up here to tell me what the hell I'm doing, right? <laughs> because I know biologically what I, what I should do, but I have no idea how you guys do any of this stuff because I've never done it, really. I study it. Right, and I go out to what you do, but I don't know how you. I mean, well, well, I was going to say I can't even put the, my feet on the pedals of the tractor sometime, <laughs> right, to be able to move it. Debbie said to me, "We're going to buy a tractor. We're going to run Ron's tractor, our neighbor." I said, "No, I can't reach the pedals. Right, I can't use that tractor. I got to use something else." But that's you know, but that, but that's the problem. You hear me talk about the biology, and you say, "Well, I have no idea how I'm going to implement this." Right. And I'm looking and saying, well, this is a simple implementation. Well, no, it's not, and I know that. But at the same time, I'm always amazed how you guys figure out what to do in ladies and on all this stuff. And that's, I, think, I think that's where the real benefits are of these kinds of meetings. The problem is we, we were talking, there's not enough other people talking. Yeah. What else for this afternoon? Is this system even possible without a green growing cover team? Yeah, it is. Um, if you couldn't do a green growing cover, I'd figure out how to put compost or manure. You've got to have some organic matter. We farm over on the state line and you just forget Yep, yep, yeah. no. Yeah, I mean, it, you have to add some organic matter to the system, right? And as long as you can add, but you've got to add organic matter that's more in a recalcitrant phase, but if you start doing that, it, the system will change, right? Because, you, because then that, it's the carbon currency that's driving all that. Now, again, how do you, how do you manage soil temperatures and that thing's another question. What you need to do is buy everything southwest of you, <laughs> like New Mexico. <laughs> that, their grazing is pathetic. Like, there is no grass anywhere. Right. That's why we're not getting any rain. No, that's right. No, no. I, I, I totally that's feel that. like that's the problem. But. Has that environment changed in eastern New Mexico, our rainfall changed dramatically? Oh, it would. And no, and that's exactly right. I mean, that's the other part of the stuff that we do, I do, is I look at these large-scale patterns in terms of what's, in terms of soil, albedo, and whatnot, and what, well, how, that, how that landscape is changing and heating up the environment. That's why, after 37 years in Lubbock, we don't get enough rain on the west side of town. We just don't do it anymore. Because it's gotten too hot. Yeah, and you know, you guys on the west of us aren't giving it, right? <laughs> so, any other questions? So, one of the things I was going to mention too, the reason I put my um, email address on that on on the uh, 
the, the, the schedule. If you want any particular slide series or whatnot or PowerPoint, I'm more than glad to send it to you. So if you wanted information like that, because I know it's all going to be put up on, on the web. It's being recorded. So I really do thank you for taking your time out of the day to be here. Um, I've learned a lot, so I appreciate the, the chance to be with you. And uh, thanks to RN and the group for organizing this. And so um, we'll just keep talking. Yes, sir. I'd just like to say that this project has been that in several years. Well, appreciate thank that. You thank you, Ma. Thank you. It's Can we grow? You said brassicas aren't very good. Keep more plants can we grow that's going to help us get our soil in better health? Well, um, so that's a good question. So <clears throat> you can put radish in and you can put anything in like that. You just can't have it the, be the max of that cover, right? So I wouldn't give up radish because around here you need it to break up stuff, right? And to produce those, those holes. If it works, it works. But from, for a good mycorrhizal plant, it's going to be grasses of some sort, right? And it's going to be grasses of different structure and types because the carbon, the amount of lignocellulosic material is what's driving all that. You, and again, grasses are perennials, really. So you don't want to put a lot of annuals. You want to put a mixture of some annuals, some, some perennial plants that, I mean, you may have to mow them, or, you know, but that's just going to be the nature of it. Is there a yeah, they are. Oats, wheat. I mean, they're all, they all do pretty well. You got a picture of a book of something on the very first slide. Does that show all the different plants and how they relate to mycorrhizae? And does that? Okay. Yeah. I just need to look at that book. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there, there are a lot of good texts out about the mycorrhizal world that are just coming out, right? I mean, some of it, you have to be careful. Some of it, is, is the silver bullet mentality that this is the only solution and the answer is that's not true, right? Because they're, like I said, they're restricted by the same conditions that restrict us in some way, shape, or form. And so they just do it on a different level. But, I mean, you know, for me, as, as, as a fungal biologist working with you folks, I mean, that's really where, that's really how the change has to happen, right? No, uh-uh, no, no. So it seems she's going to respond a lot different to these management practices than a clay texture. That's exactly right, yeah. And it's, it's going to depend. You're going to be able to go straight no-till with right. the clay texture, so it's going to get compaction. Yeah, and, and so it's going to depend upon where you're at and what you can do. But you have to, but whether it's clay or whether it's sand, the fungi play or have a major role in all this. And so that's, that's the bottom line. So. Did she mix us something up in a jug? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I always like Kickapoy Joy Juice, so, I don't, yeah. I wish, it was, I wish it was as easy as that. I mean, I, no, I, I'm going to be pretty frank. Are there products on the market that you can add immediately and get a response, a positive response in the ears? I mean, I'm going to say, say, yes, there are. But it's crack, because you, once you start it, you can't let go of it. And you're gonna keep doing it again and again and again because you haven't done anything. You're just solving the immediate response problem. If you wanna change it, you gotta get off it. So there's not, you wouldn't say there's anything to inoculate a soil, a soil to get started. You think it's all after no matter what? It's all after no matter what. We just have to let it go. Yep. Now, you know, again, part of it is if you were farming 50 acres, I would say, yeah, that's doable. If you're farming a thousand acres, it's not doable. Because there's too much variability in, in, the, in your system to have it, right? And again, some parts of your system, I would suspect, have the right, have the right balance of, of everything. It may be small patches, but once you stop doing certain things, those patches are gonna, get, are gonna spread because that's the positive aspect of how the system is gonna respond. I mean. Even if you go to a native rangeland or grassland or forest, there's always patches of different things with good productivity, low productivity. It, it, because landscape is a mosaic, the problem is we want homogeneity when we farm. I want my 2,000 acres to do exactly the same thing across all 2,000 acres. And that's, and that's ecologically impossible. 
And so you have to look at it from that, from, from that, from that perspective. But what's, but what's important about a natural ecological system, some part of the ecological system is always highly productive at any condition. And it's going to move around, and that's what maintains the stability of that system. I'd like to share one thing I'm doing, and I'm adding um, APA biological um, biocoastal to my seed, both my cover and my cotton seed. I'm getting a pop. I think because I'm killing my cover a bit early because of being organic, I'm boosting that cotton seed with a jump, and it's like two bucks an acre. But, um, I'm putting five pounds on this 4,000 pounds of cotton seed and mixing it in there. Hmm. Yeah. Something for y'all to consider. Uh, I think it's cheap a little bit, but it's, I, I, once I get it, Built up. This is probably my fourth. Would be my fourth year of using that product. And that's the only thing I'm adding to my seed. Um, no fertility. Otherwise, over 20 plus years, going on 30. Um, so just something to ponder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Judge, tell me exactly what that is again. <coughs> gold is the name of the product. And what is it? It's a mycorrhizal. Right. right. Yeah. We had, a, we had a trial that we were working with. And we couldn't get our hands on any untreated seed. So. <laughs> so now we do. And what we saw is that we didn't get any response when we had treated seed. A lot of times where they're untreated versus treated, and we're now seeing the response. Mm -hmm. So, yep. yeah. Can you take the treatment off with a water soap? The other thing we're doing, I mean, and this is way out there, but. We're adding 20% of a, in a marginal moisture year, we're adding 20% of the weight of the seed in water and basically taking the cotton seed to the field half. Hmm. Do you have any trouble plugging up your planter with Sopson? We leave it in the mixer for four hours. It takes about four hours for the total to get it soaked up. And then it'll then we add the all coat gold for last couple of minutes of spinning. We spin it for an hour consistently and then we spin it over 30 minutes just to keep it from sticking and then add the pump coat gold. I puffs up and put one box in and you're gonna get a box and a third out <laughs> <laughs> So if you have trouble in the field, well I I you gotta chunk it or no I, I had some that got to 124 degrees and Jane D, I called Jane and I said, what do I do? And she said, plant fast. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It came out of the ground and I already got hung up on it for a couple of days. <laughs> you don't want to pre-soak a bunch like that and then let it sit for a couple of days. No, you don't want to do that. You know, the you know, yeah. yeah. And if you do have to let it sit, you need to turn it, you need to have an open container in the shade, you know, uh, it's in that black box sitting outside, it'll cook. So you uh, that's what people told me. Yeah. <laughs> the guy wrote yeah. a pro box. Okay, cool. <laughs> my comment was going to be like, a little crack early seems to work really well. And it feels good. You just don't want to get addicted. No, uh-uh. That's right. Yep. So crack is bad for souls. But what about something more like heroin? <laughs> Get on that H train. No, I, I mean I'm 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 thinking more of a good of Chardonnay or Merlot or something like that. You know, you think about this in eco in, in normal systems, what jump starts ecological systems in in natural terms? It's where the buffalo urinate, the cows urinate. The, dot, the nitrogen that gets put in, but it doesn't get put in uniformly. It gets put in as small patches around the landscape. 
and that primes it, but it doesn't overwhelm the system, right? And you see different responses. I mean, the thing about it is, you know, in any system you have, you'll have animals digging up holes and building things and whatnot. It's those small scale disturbances that then contribute to how the system responds. But the problem with us is we take a whole landscape and disturb the whole thing and homogenize it and then nothing responds. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with adding nitrogen to a, to a system. It's just, you know, ecological systems don't have it going in all at once everywhere. Then that's a disaster. Could there be a different, could there be a different uh, school of application to where we tried to more mimic that? I mean, we know it can move around great distances. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and you know, and I hadn't thought about that till we just said it. Maybe that's, maybe that's one, you know, you do one row in, one row out. Don't put the nitrogen everywhere, you know? Put, Right. Put the cotton and keep it clean. Leave that go longer so that the microbes are alive and is that up. That's a possibility too. I mean again, and again, this is one I mean, I know from my experience my answer to this. When you plant, do you plant exactly the same space every year? Depends on your planner. <laughs> well, no, 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 but see see, but that's also part of the problem, right? Because an ecological system, plants move around the landscape, right? You know, and again, I, th I think part of the dynamic for, for all of us is to figure out what is that dynamic where we have to move things, you know? It's not moving them much, it's just moving them. On that same cover, and how far will a mycorrhiza go, let's say, in a month or two months? You know, what population can we put these in? to try to save the amount of water we can and still get that fungal growth that we want. Well, not, no, that's a good point. I mean, the data I've seen, and even, even from my own measurements, when I go out to a cotton field, if and it's been planted in terminated wheat, the cotton's been planted in terminated wheat, it doesn't matter where I sample in that field, as long as the wheat roots have been there, there are mycorrhizae. Doesn't matter. So it's a question of how you want to plant into that and how much water do you really need to get the crop up? You know, and maybe you don't have to, maybe you don't have to water every, every inner space. Again, I don't, you know, that's a, that's a question based on how those, where those plants are drawing water from and how they're drawing water. I mean, you know, I talked, you know, Bob and Michael always say cotton plants are lazy. And they're, they're, gonna, they're not gonna go out and grow much if you, if you give them a lot of water. So, but back to his question, if you can find mycorrhizae anywhere, are they, do they function as separate organisms or do they function all as one organism? It de no, it depends. So again, the problem is if you really, let me ask you another question. In a whole center pivot, I don't know, you know, however size center pivot you take, how many soil samples do you take to get, look at nutrient concentrations in that field? You just I, need one. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm just asking, right? <laughs> right. So you have no idea what the variability is across the field. I, I, and I get, well, yeah. Well, yeah. That, but that one sample is is a culmination of, of cores throughout that field. No, and I no, and I agree on that. It's still very small. No, no, no. It, no, but the problem is if you amalgamate it together and lump it, you have no idea what your field really looks like. True. None. Well, I agree. But I'm gonna I'll, I'll get, go back to this really point. Like I've got some of my own farms, and I've done like a ten acre grid, or whatever. Yeah. And it's basically looks. Similar? With some small exceptions where you go, oh, that's spot over there. Yeah. That, that spot's obviously different. Right. 
most of our schools were pretty uniform and they looked like no. negative. No, and the reason I bring this up, it goes back to this, most ecological systems are mosaic patchworks of different processes at different levels. And, but the problem is we homogenize everything in a field. We don't want it to be different because we want it to be uniform, right? But Stephen, I think you were talking about the fact that your wheat on the burrs that were done grew better, right? So that's a patch that actually did much better than, than the rest of his field for some reason. And so what you want to try to do is not necessary. You want to find out why that worked and see what you can do to generate that across the whole field. The problem is when we collect data, we don't, we don't understand what that heterogeneity really looks like. And it's those patches that are driving a lot of things in your field, because it's those patches that are determined disease and everything else. It's not, the, it's not the larger homogeneous component. It's the patches that are doing different things. But that's how ecological systems function. That deal like Stephen is talking about, what I've seen is just, it's covered. Yeah. And it's holding the moisture. Right. It's armor. So I know when we first worked with RN, um, we worked on one of his fields, and he had a section of the field where the wind blew and the stubble didn't stay. And I don't know how long it was off, but we were measuring um, daily temperature variability, microbial biomass, and soil water content, volumetric water content, surface in 15 centimeters. And it didn't matter where in the field we were, if on his no-till, if he had no cover, wherever you had cover, wherever you had cover, the microbial biomass was higher, and there was, there was um, the water level was lower, actually. Where there was no cover, the water level was completely saturated but not because nothing was using it because temperatures were so high and the water just sat there and the microbial biomass was low even though it had even though it had good moisture microbial biomass was low because the water con because the temperatures were too high and you know and, and that got that got us thinking about you know this whole question about root growth and you know and how how cotton plants really interact with with all that stuff I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's uh, this whole notion of, uh, the, of really the ecology of, of agroecosystems is, is different because of the fact of the timescales which, which we want productivity to occur. And that's the, that's the basis. But I think, let me go back to those three. I think those three, are the mo th those three summarize everything in terms of what has to happen. Okay, so I'll give you the college credit for the class. I'll sign your, sign your certificates when you leave, right? No, I do appreciate it. I've learned a, lo I've learned a lot. So. <laughs> and by the way, it's free tuition. Isn't that what the state of Texas is promising, right? <laughs> so anyway, thank you guys.